Tian a little bit of background before I introduce him. Um, usually this month we would have our Noah's Ark fashion show. Mm -hmm. But of course we have no church to have it in. And we have no Noah's Ark. <laughs> so we decided that we would all wear something we purchased from Noah's Ark. So my outfit, head to toe, shoes included, jewelry except not those hands, <laughs> included, um, all from Noah's Ark. So if, if you're wearing something from Noah's Ark, stand up. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mickey, for inviting me. 
Um, I've never wanted to turn down a free lunch. So when I said lunch, you know, <clears throat> all my life up until college, I went to Catholic school. And in my senior year of high school, um, they were trying to recruit me to become a priest. And I really wasn't sure about that idea. Uh, but the principal of the school, who was also a priest, uh, told me to go to this event that they were having at the seminary. And once again, I wasn't sure, but he mentioned that there was going to be a free dinner. <laughs> so then, you know, the idea of becoming a priest because of the dinner started to become a little appealing. So anyway, I go down and we, we go through the presentation. It was very lovely. <clears throat> and I was sitting down at the table um, with a buddy of mine. And he introduced himself to the table and he said, Hi, my name is Alex and this is my friend Sean. He's only here for the food. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed. And then the priest looked at me and he said, Don't worry, that's the only reason I'm here. So <laughs> I felt a little bit better about myself. Thanks for having me beyond just the lunch. It really is a pleasure and an honor. Um, there's a uh, quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, show me a hero and I'll write you a tragedy. Um, and I think if you, you look at the tragedy that was Hurricane Ian, we saw so many heroes. Mm -hmm. And it was my job throughout the storm to share their stories, which was just as important as the stories of all the destruction and the mayhem that you all are so familiar with. I wanted to open with a story that we did right before Thanksgiving, show it to you, and then I'll share a little bit more about stories to share and uh, the work that I do at NBC too. NBC Two's Sean Martinelli recently asked a group of strangers to meet him for lunch. And as you'll see in tonight's story to share, it turned out to be one memorable meal. In this Fort Myers restaurant, we invited 22 people to an event they know nothing about. <laughs> Among the attendees, a food truck operator. Uh, Sean contacted us. A pastor and his family. Sean Montnelli reached out. A tree trimmer. It's super nervous, absolutely, yeah. A realtor. We got a call. Um, and then I just spoke to him briefly, and then he sent an email and said, Would you like to join us? And so. <laughs> Different people all here for the same reason. It's what they did on September 28th. We're not seeing so much wind damage, it's what we're seeing. It's just this water, and this was, in fact, the perfect storm. This is has an Armageddon-type feel to it, folks. As Ian made landfall in southwest Florida, those in this room ran toward danger. <laughs> Kevin Ah and his kids went on their boat and saved 16 people. The Wickard family saved 30 more. <laughs> Sammy Sosa and Scott Sofer were responsible for at least a dozen lives. Whitney Murphy and her two boys rescued a 91-year-old neighbor. Yeah. Kara Minardi Power and her husband saved a couple fleeing their flooded home. Which brings us to why they're here. All of you in this room are heroes. When Hurricane Ian made landfall in southwest Florida, you put your lives in danger to save your fellow man. And I think that's pretty commendable. So thank you for doing that. In the spirit of thanksgiving, we have a few people here who wanted to say thanks as well, and we're going to bring them in now. Entering the room are 15 of the more than 60 souls saved by those who are seated. Uh, my name is Mary and Denine. I'm here on behalf of my dad, Jack. And my name is Amy Gonzalez. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my family. Uh, I'm Anthony Miller, my wife Christine, my son Bryce. And uh, we thought we had quite a few plans in place, and very quickly everything went out the window. Anthony soon found himself stuck with his family and neighbor Sam. Three and we stayed in the water for about three and a half hours. Through. Our angel kid. <laughs> that angel then made another rescue. Kevin said, I will not leave you, I will get to you. And um, lo and behold, um, 
Kevin, Kevin and the kids showed up and um, saved us. Bravery like that happened from Fort Myers to Naples. The desperation that was overwhelming us as the water kept flooding in kept us paralyzed in fear. And that's when we saw strangers who we now call our heroes coming through the neck deep water with a kayak looking to help. Had it not been for these two brave young men, I don't know if my family would have had the courage to make it out of our home. And I really don't know if we'd be here. And they helped to lead us through the water. Their, their quiet strength and bravery, keeping us calm, letting us know that we were okay, that we would be okay. Not far away, Heather Donlin needed a hero for her dad, Jack. As the water rose, he moved from his couch to sitting on top of his desk to finally sitting on his kitchen counters where he placed a chair as a last resort. That's when Heather posted on Facebook pleading for someone to help. With Whitney Murphy and her boys being some of the people to have seen it. She, Colin, and Luke tried early on in the afternoon to reach him, but the waters were too high to walk and the winds were far too strong. So they waited. They waited on somebody they didn't know. And they waited for the water to go down so that they could try and rescue him again. And they did. Their courage, perseverance, and determination to help saved my father's life that day. Quality of character is what is revealed when no one is looking. They could have easily glossed over my plea and Facebook post and assumed somebody else would come to his rescue. But instead, they chose to act and they chose to help. There are truly no words for how deeply I am grateful I am for what you did for our family. You have given my family the gift of time with somebody that we love. And I will always be eternally grateful. Thank you. The people that are up here in the front of this room are just a fraction of the dozens of people that you all saved during Hurricane Ian. And I don't know any other words this holiday season, this Thanksgiving season, to say other than thank you. <laughs> Two months ago, this would have been a room full of strangers. And now, they break bread like old friends. <laughs> Nearly everyone here lost their homes, and yet they still smile. All here lost the lives they knew, <laughs> and yet they still laugh. And this Thanksgiving, they will still celebrate. <laughs> Despite all we lost, they celebrate because of the heroes we gained. Now, one of the reasons why we wanted to do that luncheon was because there were so many stories of heroism after Hurricane Ian, and so many of our viewers didn't get to see them. We wanted to do something that not only told their stories once again, but gave us a chance to honor and celebrate what they did for their neighbors. Yeah, tremendous. And you could see the people when everyone walked in, they were just so grateful to see them again. And it, you told the story so beautifully. And thank you for sharing their stories. And, and that story is being told across our community. We're going to need to do that to process this trauma. This was 10 out of 10 trauma for so many people in our community. So one of the rescuees told me after they got up and they spoke, she said, this sight, seeing all those people in that room together, gives her faith in people. Yep. And I think yep. we have to keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate you, Sean. It's my privilege. Then we go to weather. <laughs> um, that's my job, right? To remind you a few times a week that despite what you see on the rest of the the news that day, that people are inherently good. And I think that so many people, whether they realize it or not, are waiting for their moment, a moment like that. And I think more of us than we realize would do something extraordinary like that for somebody else. And if you walk through your day with that thought in mind, it makes you feel a whole lot better about the people around you. 
person who's a bit annoying in, in front of you in the grocery line or uh, behind you when you're getting coffee. We can go to the next slide. I wanted to, to start... Uh, uh, no, the next one. I think if you just uh, yeah. So I just wanted to start with a little bit of my story to share. I share everybody else's stories for a living. Um, I grew up in upstate New York in Poughkeepsie, New York. And if you go to the next slide, this is me as a kid. I could never really stay still. I was always moving around and very jumpy and. You know, so this, I think, was my mom trying to take a picture of me, and all of them came out a bit blurry, but kind of shows who I was as a kid. And, you know, I was always a little bit different than most kids, and this next picture proves it. Um, so this was my Halloween costume one year. Can anybody guess who I was for Halloween? Regis. That's Regis Philbin. So, so I loved watching Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I loved all TV. I loved talk shows and news and... But in, in 2002, and at the height of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and the phenomenon that that was, um, I decided to go trick-or-treating as Regis. The good thing about my Halloween costumes is that I usually always won the costume contest, because the judges, who were most likely adults, always knew who I was. And uh, so the cool thing is, um, about seven years later, uh, my parents surprised me with tickets to go see Regis and Kelly. And so if we go to the next picture, that's Regis and I, late, great Regis Philbin, and he's holding the picture of me uh, dressed up as him. And he said, ne no one has ever dressed up as him for Halloween, so that was the first. Um, we go to the next slide. So there's me at NBC2. As, uh, as Mickey had mentioned, um, I went to school at Syracuse, and um, very quickly on, I, I realized that I wanted to try um, working in, in television. And I thought I would work behind the scenes, but they, my professors had encouraged me to maybe become a reporter. And I said, you know, I don't want to do the blood and the guts and all that stuff. And I had a professor who told me, she said, um, I, I think you're right, you'd be well suited to do the feature stories. And I said, well, there are no jobs like that. You know, you think about stories like this you mostly see on CBS Sunday Morning, for example. And I said, you know, that's the type of program that I would like to work at. And she said, well, if you're good at what you do, opportunities will come your way. And she said, so just try it. So uh, I paid my dues for a few years, and I did the blood and the guts and the politics and the fires. And every so often when I had the chance, usually on the weekends, I would find a human interest story. And I love doing those and people love watching them. And it got to the point where anytime there was a good feature human interest story, they would pass it my way. Um, anyway, I'd done enough of them that a few years ago in 2018, NBC2 wanted to create a whole series for these types of stories. And they wanted to be very intentional with it. Um, they wanted stories that would make people think to showcase the best of the human spirit in our area. Um, I always say if we could check the box and make you laugh, cry, and think, we probably did our job pretty good that evening. Um, so that, that first story I showed you, obviously a lot of effort and time went into it. It was a whole ordeal of planning a lunch for uh, 40 people uh, two months after the worst natural disaster our community has ever seen. So uh, this next story that I wanted to pull up is a more typical story to share that we would do. Um, uh, the, the franchise showcases what unites us and um, you know the themes that bond us together as human beings. Um, this next story is uh, it's about a guy who's very unassuming and uh, you wouldn't think anything of him until you sit down and have a conversation with him and those closest to him. So let's let's play that one. Yeah, I've got to get these seats redone again. Rick Fardo doesn't have a cool hobby that is what's called a rat rod. No secret talent. Yes. Just a few old cars. That's the true meaning of a rat rod, because it looks ratty. And because of that, 
Rick's not quite sure why we're here. Yes. In his words. Yeah, I'm not that interesting of a person. <laughs> Rick thinks he's telling the truth. And shorten this, chop this. Though it's anything but. He's not interesting? Tim. Oh, but he's vivid. <laughs> he's definitely vivid. He's Superman. I literally would have to call him Superman just because he is the impossible. To understand why, you have to go back to the Rick Fardo of the 70s. Rick Fardo with hair, the guy who became a corporate executive and had it all. Limos, famous people, casinos with rock stars in them. Before I got married, I told my now ex wife, I said, I don't want children. I want my cars, I want to travel, I don't like kids touching my stuff. <laughs> but after Rick's marriage ended, the new bachelor had an inexplicable change of heart. I can't really tell you how it happened. It just did. <laughs> Almost on a whim, Rick decided to take in foster kids. And you failed at that miserably. Terribly. And uh, 10 adoptions later, <laughs> here we are. Soon, dinner for one <laughs> became a feast for 11. Well, let's see. Sometimes I miss one or two. <laughs> um, Austin, which is my youngest, then Nathaniel, Jacob, Jason, Tim, Vincent, Michael, Bill, Ron, and Ricky. Being here and having the life that we have now is just something that some people can only dream of. Because in each of Rick's sons, there is a story of party. Yeah. Moving around, boss cam. Places to places, anger, sadness, lost hope, something that I've been saved not again. Found because of Rick. <laughs> He's basically saved in all of our lives. That's a pretty big statement. Oh yeah, it is. It's the truth though. Oh yeah, it is. He took us from these really bad places in our lives and just gave us the opportunity to become what we really want to be. He basically stepped in and showed me what having a dad was like. Yeah. They've grown to be pretty good, productive adults, and I'm so proud because <laughs> everybody always says, oh, you've done all this. I'm like, no, no, my life can provide the path. But, you know, they have to make the choice that they want to make more out of their life. This is in no way the life that you thought you were going to have. No. But are you happy with the life that you got? Oh, absolutely. Rick still calls himself uninteresting. Everyone else here, though, just calls him Dak. Oh. I know you're not perfect. Love you too, buddy. In Port Charlotte, Sean Martinelli, NBC2. Even the most uninteresting, so-called uninteresting among us can have really fascinating stories. Um, Mickey, if you can help me, I have a folder here, and um, during the course of this presentation, I have these sheets of paper, and if you think of somebody that you know that may be worth doing a story to share on, I want you to fill that sheet of paper out and uh, write your name on it and your email address. Because we're always looking for stories. Um, during the height of COVID, it was really hard to find stories because I was getting emails from people and um, they had the same theme to them. Someone was making masks for someone else. And we did that story. And then we got the story pitched again and again and again. And I couldn't do stories of people making masks every night or people would turn the channel pretty quickly. So I had this idea at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning when most of my ideas come into my mind. And uh, the idea was I would write out these letters, and the letters would say, if you find this note, I want to come and do a story to share on you. And we put them on park benches, and I put them on people's cars from Fort Myers to Punta Gorda down to Naples. And, uh, and people responded to them. And uh, we ended up telling four stories from those letters of just ordinary people who found the notes. And, and I have to tell you, all of them were really interesting, compelling stories. 
Um, we even had a dog find one of the notes and the dog's owner sent me the email. She said, my dog found the note. Uh, and so it was a challenge, but we did a story on the dog. And even the dog, <laughs> even the dog had, you know, in relation to its owner, a really compelling story of how it, it helped change the owner's life uh, for the better. And uh, so I, human or not, everybody has a story to share. Sean, how yeah. did you find him? How, how do you find somebody that yeah, so it actually, one of the kids reached out to me, and they watched stories to share, and I guess um, he, he said, obviously, my dad has not only changed my life, but all my siblings' lives, and uh, they sent me a newspaper article that they had done on him uh, in their hometown uh, up in Ohio, and they said, if you're interested in doing a story, so it was the son who reached out. Nice. Yeah. Um, why don't we go to the next slide here? So story to share, you know, every time I go out and we film a story, it, it gets me thinking about what matters most in our lives, right? You know, when, when uh, the lights are turned off and, and you're, you're just sitting there alone with your thoughts, what matters most? And it, those things, no matter, you know, who you voted for, or your background, how rich or poor you are, usually the same thing. You know, it, it's it's a love for family, um, and and I think most times it's it's a love for each other and those who are closest to us. Over the years, stories to share has gotten more personal uh, for me, and I've shared some more of my family stories. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for people who believed in me um, and enabled my dreams to become possible. And as I've grown up and moved through the world, I've learned that that's a pretty good thing to help other people achieve their dreams can sometimes be more fulfilling than achieving your own. Um, why don't we play the next story? Someone who's played a big role is my grandfather. And I get emotional in the story too, but we participated in a project called StoryCorps and we aired this story a few weeks ago. So I wanted to end on this and then of course take your questions and uh, we'll go from there. NBC2's Sean Martinelli wants you to join an effort to help preserve the stories of humanity. You're about to see how in tonight's story to share. Over the holidays, I downloaded an app called StoryCorps. If you're not familiar, StoryCorps is a nonprofit whose mission is to preserve and share humanity's stories. We can find wisdom and poetry all around us. All we have to do is listen. You use your phone, they give you some suggested questions, and you have a conversation with someone you love. Those interviews are then archived in the Library of Congress. Ask simple questions like, what are you most grateful for? How do you want to be remembered? Then, listen. It's I did one with my grandfather, Michael Flaherty, and I learned things about him I never knew. I want to share some of our conversation in hopes you'll consider participating in this project too. Can you tell me about one of your happiest memories? Probably realizing uh, my future wife was the person I wanted to marry. It wasn't like a, a flash of lightning. It was just something that you realize that that was probably the person for you. What are your hopes for me, my children? I, I, my, I guess if I really thought about it, that you get to live the life you want. And uh, then at the end of it, you can look back on it and say, it wasn't perfect, uh, but it was good. If this was to be our very last conversation, is there anything you'd want to say to me? Yes, I'd say, Sean, I love you, I love you since you were born. And that will never go away. When I asked my grandpa his favorite memories of me, he couldn't think of much. At 88, those memories are fading, but mine are still vivid. I remember the birthdays, the milestones, and all those 
those Christmas Eve dinners. And I'm glad you're all here. That's why at the end of our interview, when StoryCorps suggests you tell the interviewee what they've meant to you, I didn't have words. For the last part of the interview, I'm supposed to tell you what you've meant to me. And I always get emotional when I think about it. It's okay, John. I'm, I'm glad. It's good that it's emotional. It's good that you have. Uh, see, I never, I never got to know my grandfathers. Okay, so I'm glad you have. I'm glad you have. Good parent. It's a good thing. People often ask me what's been my most memorable interview. Now I have a new answer. Thanks to StoryCorps, it was the one with that man, my grandfather, Sean Martinelli, NBC2. Oh, Sean, thank you for sharing that with us. So personal, but so beautiful. That's it. I'm calling my grandma after this news. <laughs> you know, my, my real... Uh, goal in every story is just to try to make Kelly Burns cry. And, you know, it was a good story if you can make Kelly cry. Um, you know, I, I spoke to my grandfather after that story aired, and because and, I told him, I said, I've received hundreds of messages from people, and they said that they were going to download StoryCorps and participate in this project, and it reminded so many of them, whether they still have their grandparents or not, those conversations and those moments. And he said, it, if we can get people talking to each other in some way, then it was all worth it. It was all worth it. He just, he just thought that that was the best thing, that people were excited about talking to each other and preserving their stories. And, you know, um, it, people ask me sometimes, how do we find our way back home? Right? How do we, in, in, in the world that we live in, where there's so much bickering and division, how do we find our way back home? And I think that's where we start. It's talking to people, whether they're people that you've known your whole life or people that you've never met before and hear their stories. Um, Dr. Brene Brown has a quote that I love, and she says, it's hard to hate people close up, move in. Really powerful. And um, like I said before, I've talked to people who, um, Democrat, Republican, uh, people who believe in all sorts of different things. And I walk away from every single interview thinking that was a good person at their core. And uh, I think that if we, can, if we can go about our lives with that thought in our head, the world will be a heck of a lot better place. So thank you for having me here, and I'd, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Um, but it's been a real, a real privilege. Thank you. So these, the ones that we watched were kind of more like tear jerkers. Um, but if Mickey, and I know some of you live at Shelf Point, right? Some of you know Mickey lives there. One of my first stories here um, was a, uh, about a, a, a resident of Shelf Point, and um, everybody knew him, and his name was Jonathan Livingston. Does anybody know Jonathan? Have you ever heard the name before? So Jonathan was well loved at Shell Point, and everybody knew him. He uh, was the world's oldest hermit crab, 46 years old, and he was living at Shell Point. Now I haven't done a follow up to to hear if uh, Jonathan is still with us, but he was approaching 50, which uh, apparently in hermit crab years is uh, a well lived life. <laughs> How was so, he as an interview? Was he a good interview? You know, he, he seemed to be at a loss for words. <laughs> which, you 
know, you have Sean Mardelli come in to interview you for a story. I mean, that happens. Um, but, you know, uh, it's my job as an interviewer to try to pull something out of you. I, I didn't fare too well then. Um, yeah, you know, so to answer your question, we do. We do some that, that are just, you know, really lighthearted um, and, and really interesting, quirky characters that we find. Uh, along the way. I, I like, though, in every story for there to be some sort of takeaway for people. Um, you know, we did kind of a lighthearted one recently, uh, right before the storm, where I was going through my voicemail inbox, because I save all my voicemails. I don't know if you guys do, too. And there was one from my landlord in there, and my old landlord. There was one from a stranger who dialed by mistake. There were so many messages from my Aunt Alice, who calls a lot. <laughs> um, and you know, and then we ended with my, my other grandfather who passed away a few years ago. I had one from him on there. And um, you know, I think the takeaway from that, as silly as it was for you know throughout the story, was you know, sometimes it's better to skip the text and just pick up the phone and call somebody. It'd be pretty powerful. Well, thanks for the question. Anything else? Easy crowd. I mean, so, well, one time I got a question. I was down in Naples, and somebody asked me, um, "What role do you think the media has to play in our the divisiveness in our country right now?" <laughs> and you know, my answer to the question was, "I'm not going to speak for what happens on the dark corners of the internet because technically, you could consider that to be media, but that's not reputable journalism." I'm not going to speak for what happens after 8 o'clock on the cable news networks, because that's commentary, that's not real journalism. I'm going to speak for the work that I do and, you know, and, and what NBC2 does, which is honest, fair, local journalism that holds people accountable, that sometimes holds truths, uh, exposes truths that are inconvenient but necessary to share, and journalism that shines a light on the best of people who people are at their core. Mm -hmm. um, thank you.